So we're back. Uh, we are back. And we will start with a pledge since we are back from exec into open session and in public. And we will start with a pledge. I pledge allegiance. When we have musical, that's great. We're going to do the national anthem at the same time. Not only the pledge now. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Very good. Welcome. Just welcome, welcome. We, uh, we are running a bit late, but Dr. John, it's for good reason, because we had commendations. Yes. At 5:30, and as Dr. Brown says, it it was the biggest one yet. I've heard I've heard that a lot, Dr. Brown lately. So, uh, but it was uh, it was a very good commendation ceremony, and uh, it was the best. Believe me, it was the biggest and the best ever. I was just thinking that. Oh, well, that's why uh, I said anyway. So it's. Uh, <laughs> So we, uh, we have done the pledge. I don't have much voice today, so you're not going to hear from me we're, because we're going to have uh, lots of uh, guests speak tonight, and we will get to that very quickly. Uh, any modifications to the agenda? No. No. So we'll move on. Public comments. Anyone from the public wish to speak? We have lots of folks going to speak, and I think we're, we're okay, so we're going to keep moving. And student reps, and we'll start with LACS. Hey. Hey. Uh, so the biggest thing that's happened in the past two weeks at LACS is that our student-run Shakespeare program put on their show of Midsummer Night's Dream, and it was very good. The costumes were amazing, the acting was amazing, and the sets were really beautiful, and we were really proud of them. They did an amazing job. Yeah. I've been in Shakespeare in the past, and all the kids worked so hard to put on an amazing show for everybody. We are proud of them. Um, also, last time we talked about um, some of the proposals that were going on at LACS, and one of them was about student parking. Well, a decision was made by students and staff conjoint decision, or was it split student staff? I think it was student and staff. Student and staff together voted that students should not be able to park on campus. And um, so we have returned to the old rule of parking on uh, the street and walking kind of far. But that's fine because that was a democratic decision. Are there decision no buses in LACS? There are. Oh, no, but okay. it's for right, students who check. drive. Yeah. So there's like a few people who do drive, and um, it's like fine. It's not too far. Um, but it was interesting because we had both middle <coughs> schoolers and high schoolers, as well as teachers, voting on this decision. Where do those students typically park? We park on Chestnut Chester. Street, like in front of the apartments that are kind of next to oh, LACS. Okay. It's just like a little bit farther of, of a ways to walk when it's really cold. It's really not that far. But go ahead. City blocks, half a block. We are happy that we were able to come to a democratic decision on something, and it was really exciting because it was a proposal submitted by a student. Um, that wanted to change something that wasn't just, we usually get a lot of proposals about changing the format of the decision making process. <laughs> so this is one that was kind of like exciting and out of the normal. So it was really, it was a fun time to be able to discuss and vote on it. Uh, so next Wednesday on the 13th is our annual spaghetti dinner. Um, the how long has spaghetti dinner been going on for? A long time. <laughs> I don't know specifically how long. Um, okay. So the funds raised by the entry ticket will now be uh, distributed, well not now, will be distributed uh, among the spring trips and like our committees and family groups have chances to like set up booths with um, crafts and things they've made to sell and fundraise for their family groups and committees. Um, 
Other than our pecan sale, it is the main fundraiser we do at LACS as a whole school, and it is a community event as well as a fundraising opportunity, so everyone is invited. It's going to be at the IHS cafeteria on the 13th from 5 to 8 p.m. The reason why we're doing it at IHS and not LACS is because we don't have big enough space at LACS, and uh, we are very grateful to be able to use the IHS cafe cafeteria. We've been doing it there for... Um, a little while now. It's been that way since I've gone to LACS. And it's really great because um, it's always like the tables are set up around the edges with the fundraising booths. We've got silent auctions and bake sales and craft sales, as Naomi was saying. And it's just a good way to raise money at the beginning of the year. So everyone is invited to come. There's going to be pasta and other cool things going on. So, yeah. Excellent. Thanks. Hit the guy. Thank you. So um, at our most recent student council meeting where uh, the school sort of gathers and talks about school wide issues and ideas, some of the new uh, ideas to make our school a bit more fun were uh, decorating the parking lot, maybe using chalk and stuff, but I'm not sure if that idea has been passed to the administrators that they would be okay, <laughs> okay with that, but that, that's coming soon. And also there are a lot, a lot of people wanted a winter pep rally because they thought it was sort of unfair slash not fun that a lot of winter sports and also spring sports weren't really included in the fall pep rally and nobody, because our school doesn't really have a lot of uh, events where all the school comes together and has school unity. So, uh, potentially creating a winter pep rally would really bring our school together and give us another opportunity to have fun. And um, at the student council meeting, a lot of people were still super persistent about the paper versus plastic cup issues for the uh, water coolers. And I remember last time at the last board meeting, the, the reps asked, I forget somebody, about uh, whether there would be a, there could be a potential alternative to the, to the plastic cups maybe paper cups, so maybe if someone could address that in the in the board responses. Uh, and uh, for sports, uh, the, boards, the boys varsity swim team, which I am also on, uh, competed in our first meet of the season at the Hilton Invite, which is near Rochester, New York, uh, this past Saturday. Saturday. Uh, the team did very well. We placed first overall in the meet, and there were a lot of different first, second, and third place finishes in the individual events. Um, so this past Saturday, the handball tournament took place, and it was hosted by the senior class. And the overall purpose was to increase class unity. And for a quick recap, the tournament finished in an 8-8 to -8 tie in the finals. And um, most of the people who played in the tournament thought it was a very fun, rewarding experience. This past Friday, December 1st, Link Crew hosted a cookie decorating event. So it was the freshmen and Link leaders, and they decorated cookies together. And it was a great opportunity for those on Link Crew to check in with their freshmen and make sure that everybody was having a good first half of their year. Next um, Friday, December 15th, in activities, there will be the annual craft fair. So crafts from local vendors, as well as many clubs make food in order to fundraise. And for January, the Tatler will be publishing their annual literary issue, and it will include photos, creative writing, visual art, and original music from students. Um, next Thursday, December 14th, in Colt Auditorium, there will be the orchestra concert. <coughs> um, and this past Saturday, the SAT, SAT took place, um, and next Saturday, the ACT will take place at IHS. On Thursday, on Friday, December 7th and 8th, there will be a student that will give the on in the Black Box Theater from 7:30, and the IHS band concert will held will held um, will be performing at the Cult December 12th. So that's next Tuesday, 7:30. Thanks, I think. Hi, uh, board responses. Sean, do you want to weigh in on? Plastic we, cups. And we didn't bring it up at the last facilities meeting, so, but we can. Uh, the next facilities meeting is January 2nd, if I'm not mistaken. Mm -hmm. um, and it's an agenda item we can put on for that meeting if that, and keep folks posted or feel free to join us on January 2nd for that meeting as well. Even better. There's no good answer. I mean, the, the answer is there's no good answer. I mean, the, the plastic is recycled, uh, paper can be recycled also, and it had to do with uh, who had the lowest bid. On providing the water, they provided the cups as well. I mean, we can ask them for paper um, if that's the recycled, preferred recycled material instead of plastic is the preferred recycled material. Uh, we can do either. Um, but paper has wax, and, and the paper has the wax on mm -hmm. it, so it's it's not as ideal. 
uh, for recycling. Uh, so with that, we can stick them in the plastic. By next fall, will Ithaca High be back on? Or are we going to be another half a year before they're back on? You know, we're working our way through the buildings, but... Well, David, this David goes, back, this goes to the question of the, the bottle fillers and right. drinking fountains, and we can only put them where it didn't exceed previously, even though we're putting a filtering system in the, health, the Tompkins County Health Department as opposed to the New York State Health Department uh, won't allow us to, to do that. Correct. Yet. Correct. Yet, they might. And, and I think... Um, you know, it's difficult to determine right now the timeline in terms of the high school because, you know, I think we have different, we have, we've really talked a lot about the elementary schools and the approaches in the elementary schools. Um, we have water on the agenda every single time at facilities. We, we can absolutely think about the secondary schools um, if we're going to take the same approach of full remediation of, you know, outlets, uh, piping, um, in the secondary schools like we're doing in the elementary schools or look a little bit deeper at the testing results, see if there are um, units that um, never ever tested high and that were always below the action levels, um, you know, do we turn those back on? So I think that that's something that facilities could definitely, we can add cups as well as fixture remediation um, in terms of specifically the secondary schools at the next facilities. Yeah, I just don't want to move away from recyclable. Mm -hmm. Mr. Grinch, Dr. Grab, may we uh, may suggest we invite uh, Matt Knight to the next meeting? Uh, DeWitt, I was there last week, and they transitioned away from using cups. Mm -hmm. and, but it's looked like them purchasing water bottles for everyone. Right. Um, but they have an interesting process to sure. uh, do that and monitor that. So something yeah, I'll be great. positive about. Very good. And I will point out that David Brown is very happy not to answer any questions about <laughs> yeah, that. So, uh, so, uh, so, uh, the gays went that way, but was right past David. Right? So, uh, but we will talk more about water January 2nd to uh, get through New Year's, and then we'll talk about water. Um, so uh, thank you, everyone. And uh, any other board responses at this point? Before we go on, I'm not seeing it one. That's good. Uh, consent agenda. I will move the shortest consent we've seen in a long time. Second. Second by Pat. So it's so short, then there probably are no questions, correct? Yes. Any comments needed to be made? <coughs> are we good? Mm -hmm. Move second and all in favor. That is, that is everyone. In, and then there were eight. Uh, we are eight, right? Mm -hmm. We are eight. So, uh, so Dr. Brown, we are eight, and you are one, and it's your turn. Thank you for the opportunity, Ms. Nancy. Today was Team ICSD Day, and I wish to thank our community for celebrating our school district today with pictures, uh, notes, you name it, about what the school district means to them. You can follow the hashtag Team ICSD, Team ICSD on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram to see images, posts, all things good. So thanks again for everyone for doing this. It's our second year, and uh, we plan to do this every year. Maybe add some different twists each year. Next year we think about something to do differently. But today was a, a successful day, and it was a great combination with the uh, combination ceremony. Transitioning, uh, we're going to be handing out a document. Uh, thought we would take an opportunity tonight. We have a, uh, a principal who, who's announced her retirement, uh, Diane Carruthers at LACS. And we have been thinking and in conversations with the staff there and others about what the principal search would look like, will look like. And Mr. Uh, Mr. Van Kieran is in here also. Uh, we are going to be with the site council, LACS, on December the 14th to finalize an uh, advertisement. So uh, the first step in finding the next learning leader for that great building is to advertise. And we plan to advertise nationally. And what we say in that advertisement is going to be key. So we want to make sure folks get a good sense of what the school offers and what type of building it is, because it is a, a different high school uh, and a, a, a model, from my perspective, of what a high school can be for young people. So we want to make sure our advertisement is clear about this opportunity. We will advertise, and you'll see, I won't read all these dates. Uh, we will be posting this online. But we plan to advertise the first week in, in January. And we plan to then, uh, as we've done with other principal searches, we will have a feedback session where we will do a survey, 
Bob and I will be going out to meet with students, parents, community members about the desired characteristics in the next learning leader. We plan to do that through January and February. Late January, early February, we will start to screen applications. And what we've done with principal search is the screening of applications is done by Mr. Van Curen and I, or another member of the exec team, where we really go, oftentimes we do site visits, uh, we call references, we call folks who aren't listed as references. We do quite a bit of vetting with those folks who apply or who have an interest in coming to our school district. That's the application screening application process. From there, we put candidates that after vetting, we feel could be the next learning leader of that building. We put those candidates in. Sometimes we've had up to eight or nine. Sometimes we've had uh, three or four. We put those folks in front of a committee. And this, I won't put you on the spot tonight, but we have shared that committee's made up of the various stakeholders in the particular school community, parents, students, uh, staff members, et cetera. After the interview process, what we've done with other principal searches and we'll do with this one as well, we then bring the folks, the candidates in, the final candidates in. Sometimes it's been three, sometimes it's been one uh, after the initial interviews. And we then have another round of conversations with them. That conversation, include, that conversation includes myself and oftentimes board members where we do some additional vetting of the final candidates. And that's a more informal conversation. And then from there, finally, we plan to bring a name to the Board of Education in early March uh, as a recommendation after multiple rounds of vetting and conversation. We hope to bring a name to the Board of Education in March with an anticipated start date of July 1. If we don't find the right person, it won't, that person won't, no one will be starting July 1. We will look at it in we will look at We are going to find the best person for this role. And as we said in other instances, if we don't find a great person, which we have much confidence that we will, we will extend the search. Um, and we won't have the person start in July. If I may, can I stop there? Any, any questions from the board, the board about this? You've all been through this process before, and it's a very similar process to what we've had previously. So, one question. Yeah. The feed, the, the Tell me of the feedback solicitation and the announce and the advertisement. Yeah. Um, obviously, we can't go around soliciting feedback from critical constituents when they're on vacation. <laughs> but would it not be helpful to have some of that feedback for the actual advertisement? Yeah, we're getting that now. I mean, we've already met with the staff. Uh, <coughs> and site based council is another opportunity to get some of that. So. And site-based council, I think, have reached out to the community. I believe there has been a survey that's a more internal survey where we're getting that feedback. So that uh, advertiser will be informed by a lot of thinking already. <laughs> so a very inclusive, thorough process that will bring the next learning leader to LECS. Other thoughts, questions about that process, which is very similar to our other principal searches. And then finally, I just want to take this opportunity to give a shout out to two schools, Boynton and particularly BJM. Our administrative team, I wrote about this in our insider. We this year we're focused our we are focusing our principal meetings on getting into other buildings, getting into our buildings, and looking in classrooms and looking at what the environments are saying to our young people and if they're culturally responsive and how they're culturally responsive and how inclusive they are. And it's been one of the best learning opportunities I've ever been a part of. And I have to speak to what we saw. And at BJM. It was, it, from my perspective, the best model I've ever seen as far as classroom spaces that were culturally responsive and inclusive. Everything from what young people are sitting on, where they're sitting on, the types of materials that are in their reading libraries, to what's on the wall. And then to see young people interact with those spaces was something that I'm now inviting our board members to see. And if there is a community member who wishes to see what culturally responsive teaching practices look like and inclusive environments look like in a public school setting, please send me an email and I would have I would ask you to walk with me to see what's happening. And we've only we just started we're gonna be at the high school soon. I think next week we're at Enfield and where else are we going next week? LACS. LACS. And me having that in my role, I'm able to see all of our spaces in the school district. And we have other spaces too, but what I saw at BJM from my perspective, it was the best I've ever seen. Um, and I just wanted to share, share that with the board and also invite you to be a part of these walks. We were calling them instructional rounds. Seven years ago, they were walkthroughs. Then it was, uh, we called it something different. Now they're instructional rounds, where we're literally just looking and learning about these spaces. And it's been remarkable from my perspective. 
again, an invite. Thanks for the team at CSD Day. And if you have other questions about the search, let me know. Thank you, sir. Excellent, Dr. Brown. So we'll move on to school district business. And number one on school district business is Ithaca High School. Come on and up, we yes. have a variety of leaders from Ithaca High School in the, in the room. Big eye ties that I see there. Okay. Recognize that Dr. Brown's going to hold me to five minutes, and that Johnson City is in town tonight for the first uh, ladies' home game. So uh, we've got a few things going on. But, uh, but Dr. Brown asked that uh, I come speak to you about uh, why school, and comes to Ithaca High School, and what's Ithaca High School's perspective on it. Give us some indications in terms of some of the key levers and things that we're doing. I gave you a one page, uh, hopefully it came out in colored copy, uh, that we really at Ithaca High School is in, every, every high school in New York State is charged with uh, graduating students that are college and career ready. And I'm sitting in front of this board before, I think Ithaca High School does a wonderful job getting kids ready for college who struggle a little bit in the career part. And I, I think we have a plan to address that, and I'll share that here in, in some of the key lever work. But uh, we've done a lot of work, and, 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 and my, uh, my colleagues from Ithaca High School could probably speak to our four core values. We talk about uh, a culture of love and engage, empower, and educate, um, and what those things mean at Ithaca High School. We went through quite a process of community building last spring with the staff, the larger faculty, to really identify what are our four core values at Ithaca High School. In other words, what do we want students to graduate with? And the way we framed it and we rolled it out to the students on the very first day of school is that I really want everybody to hold me to those four core values. And I want as an adult staff to be held to those four core values. And those four core values are the, the bold at the very bottom of the page. Tenacity, ownership, compassion, integrity. Those four, you can see them posted up what I call student lane as students get off the bus right along the outside of the Hall of Fame room at the high school. They're posted heavy in, in each courtyard, and every single classroom has the, the four core values on their doors. Many teachers uh, at the beginning of the school year began their relationship building and establishing their, their curriculum and syllabi and their courses around these four core values to really drive those home. I've had a lot of staff members write to me, students write to me, and they'll say tenaciously, X, uh, or say, Mr. Trumbull, you're not being tenacious enough in doing this. Or you've got to display a bit more ownership in this. You can't pass the buck, Mr. T. So as Dr. Brown has taught me, all good leaders are going to eat their own words sometimes. Uh, you use different language. Yeah. But, uh, but, but for me to have the four core values, uh, there was a, a, a neat uh, Tatler article not long ago about the advocacy of, of waiting uh, music grades that Mr. Trumbull or the high school administration hasn't been tenacious enough. We need you to do X, Y, and Z. Every Monday morning, I have a student with me, or a couple of students, or a staff member with me to unpack the four core values. And I really give them carte blanche in terms of what that looks like. What does it look like to own uh, our work at Ithaca High School? What does it mean to be tenacious in the classroom, in the hallways, on the athletic field? I think uh, the commendation ceremony speaks largely to that. And we're certainly a strong part of that as we had great representation tonight uh, from the student body. So really trying to help students be college and career ready, what do those things mean? We really want students to cross that stage, having demonstrated those four core values. So this isn't something that we're doing to students. This is something that we're doing collectively as a, as a large community. But when we get into the teaching and learning innovations, we've listed four bullet points with each one, and some of some acronyms there. But I just wanted to highlight one under each uh, subsection, under teaching and learning innovations. We're pretty excited about bullet number two, what we're calling new career exploration partnership with our PTA. We've been doing a lot of work in student services and the larger school community to really identify what should goals be for freshmen in the first marking period? What should goals be for juniors in the third marking period? What should seniors be looking at? In other words, we're trying to create a win-win kind of larger system with our PTA and our larger community. We've long said that Ithaca High School is the community, so we continue to bring the community in. In other words, and I'm going to invite all of you to do this, we're going to start the first week of the second semester in early February and begin inviting community members in to speak specifically about the work that they do in our community and invite students to come down and partake in those conversations. Very much like we do with colleges already. We have a college in our school two to three times a week. Currently, it's great, kids drop in. We're gonna offer, with, with the PTA, we're gonna offer food and have folks come in and talk about the larger, what do, what do I do uh, in my career? How long did it take me to get there? What kind of things do we wanna have happen? So that students can then start to um, start setting goals. 
uh, for what they're home and doing and larger exposure to the world of work outside of school so that students can start thinking about, well, do I want to go to college? Do I want to go out of the career force? And what then might that look like? And we're now talking about that program morphing into larger, how do we, how do we interview for colleges? How do we interview for careers? What are soft skills? How do we teach those things? What does it mean to be on time? What does it mean to be responsible? And going back to the four core values. So we're, we're pretty pleased with that. And as I said to the PTA, this will be a, a long success if this thing's still going 10, 12 years. Every Friday, we've got more community members coming back and folks saying, I want to give back to the high school. And my ultimate goal is like to see students that were inspired by folks that came in continue to perpetuate that. We've got uh, two young IPD officers that are recent graduates of the high school that I'm thinking of in particular when we talk about these things. So pretty cool along those lines. In terms of the culturally <coughs> responsive practices, uh, describe our freshman family fun night, um, our family welcome night. We're all about relationships with the high school. Folks will often say, how can you do it with 1,400 students? The way we do it is we invite families to school. Uh, we had, what, a quadrupling of our freshman uh, fun night. We had over 400 people in the cafeteria, standing room only. We had a um, 100 link crew students. Link crew students called every family, sent postcards to every family. Uh, we called families, we did our community outreach to invite people there. We had the quad filled with uh, DJs, um, it was a cornhole game, all, 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 oh, we had a club and activity fair. So that was folks' first um, taste of Ithaca High School. And, and hearing folks say, you know, my older child went here, but all of a sudden, here, here we go. We've had a concert in the quad already and uh, looking to do some power, and it'll probably come to the Board of Ed uh, Associates Committee to up our power in the uh, quad. We've got a couple concerts there, so we envision some things happening in, in the quad to be uh, a bit more uh, uh, driven that way. In regards to inclusion, uh, the first bullet point talks about our PLC day that uh, we really went after, how do we make sure that all our students are included? We watched a film called Paper Tigers, which described these things called ACEs, which are adverse childhood experiences. Uh, pretty deep film, we watched it as a staff together in Culp, uh, had a number of bus drivers with us. Uh, we're blown away by the amount of care that a particular school gave the students, but recognizing what are some of the social emotional factors um, that face all of our students today. Um, broken homes, um, homelessness, uh, extreme poverty, drug and alcohol abuse. What happens when students are faced with these cases that get in the way of learning? So we continue to grow as a staff in terms of identifying where students are in society. I know you as a board are faced every day with, with concerns about anxiety of young people and anxiety of staff in a larger, in a larger setting. Uh, Dr. Brown and the team and I have had many conversations about what should structures look like at Ithaca High School to help all students. Um, you know, so, so, so when we think about inclusion, we're really talking about all students being successful and recognizing where students come from. So um, I, again, wanted to hit with one bullet point each key lever, and I guess at this point, turn it over to you if you have any questions in regards to clarification of things that I described or anything that's on the paper that might not be, uh, might not lend itself to clarity in terms of what we're trying to get after this guys. Go ahead. Only question that, um, I have a inclusion the last bullet point. I literally just don't know what that means. Yeah, so our RTI team is response to intervention. We've been engaged in response to intervention as a district for probably close to 10 years. Uh, and at the secondary level, it's, it's a, a, a tall order. In other words, response to intervention will identify when a child is struggling in school, try to collect data in terms of what's happening, try to identify a goal to help the student, and then provide enough resources and support around the child to make to help them be successful. Struggle at the secondary level because you've got up to six, seven, eight adult staff working with, with children. We're moving away from a model that has a standalone team of educators as well as social emotional um, professionals that are in receivership of referrals saying, Timmy's struggling or Susie's struggling, and that team then not having a relationship with the child saying, well, how about this, how about that, or how about this? Now redefining RTI to saying it's two or more people, so it could be the content area teacher, could be a special ed teacher, could be a school counselor saying, I know Timmy, he struggles with uh, reading comprehension, I think we should try to do X, Y, and Z, it might require a, a parent meeting, um, we're going to have a, an identified goal of, of uh, we're going to use these three reading strategies and track that. So uh, we're hoping to have a more dynamic response around students so that we're not caught in the old model of um, refer to somebody else and wait for an answer. 
Other questions? And go ahead. Uh, I have a question. Uh, it's a comment. I just I like the seeing this approach, and I just I, I like the anchor of the four pillars there. It's something that's kind of anchoring your the rest of your thinking. It seems like a good approach to me. It's, it's been a it's it, it's been a neat fall. Um, and really trying to drive home what, what, we're, what we're trying to do. I, I put up there, our vision really still is 100% engagement in high school. But we struggle sometimes to, to set data points around what does 100% engagement look like. So we're hoping we're digging a little bit deeper here to say um, where do we want to be and that, uh, that we're all proud as a community that we hold these as four core values. And again, we think it fits nicely into the culture of love and uh, our mission and vision uh, as a district. Uh, maybe you said this before, just the development of these four core values. You want to speak to that briefly? Yeah. Um, we had a couple of staff members go up to uh, a school up in Rochester last year, look at PBL, mm -hmm. and all around the school we were all kinds of identified goals in terms of where they going to be. So we came back as a leadership team and talked about that and invited our department leaders and really said, we framed it as what do we want our, our students to espouse uh, as they leave Ithaca High School morphed into what do we want to help develop with our students and what do we want to model. Then went out to the larger faculty. Um, we all use our Chromebooks to really uh, identify what were the words we're going after. Vetted it down to eight, six or eight. Got it down, took non-instructional staff, ultimately voted as a staff, and we're ready to go with the uh, crew in the fall. If, if I did it again, I'd have more student voice at the table. Go ahead, Rick. Tell me about your concurrent courses in TC3. It says increase. What do you have now? We have where do you hope where do you hope to go? We had 14 uh, last year. We're up to 26 um, students. Of course, 26 courses, courses offered at the concurrent enrollment, which means the student take school takes class at school. They're also receiving TC3 credit for it. Right. And so students are finishing the high school with what six credits, nine credits, more, more. A semester's worth? Depends on the student. I can't get a little bit deeper there, but yeah, yeah. A number okay. of students are walking out with credit, and, and these are courses that might be a little more accessible than AP courses. Sure. Um, but the level of rigor is there, and then the students, because the other piece we want to make sure is when students are graduating, that we're, we're not then doing remedial math, remedial writing afterwards as well. That's really a the push of the conversation that we're trying to have. So the more offering a concurrent enrollment, um, there are some schools around the country where students are graduating with an associate's degree and a, and a, uh, a diploma together. We haven't fought, thought that far through. It's more about the access to, to, yeah. to high rigor courses. It is, okay, and are we looking at things like their hospitality program or any of those, or is it primarily uh, the more academic? It's been more traditionally based. Traditionally. Yeah. It, we, we made some big inroads in the arts last year, mathematics, English as well. Oh, some but of the arts as well. Uh, okay, great. Drawing and painting and ceramics are going to be offered in the spring for, uh, for credit. Fantastic. We can run a report that, uh, and I'll send to the board uh, that, that lists the number of courses we offer, and then we can show some trend data about the number of students who are taking them and how many credits on average and the raw number that they're receiving. And this is, we need to do more. Um, I, I've met with Dr. Montague, the new president, and she's identified this, and particularly the city school district as an area that needs to increase. With our size and with our location, we need to have this as a much more valuable option for young people. Um, are these so, all at the high school? Yes. Yeah, all, yeah. Right, just be clear for folks. folks. Ultimately, some, ultimately, some programs that, that do end in a, we We had a meeting with TC3 to really talk about what our offerings were, and they were there wasn't consistent lines, it was kind of piecemeal here and there. We're, we're building a, a broader base. Ultimately, um, some schools, uh, Cortland, I think, not maybe Marathon, but uh, students might attend part of their senior year at TC3 campus. Oh, I see. Yeah, we're, we're, right. we're not there. Our staff is being accredited as college professors as well to be able to, to do this. So we're, we're building our broad base there, too, so it isn't limited. Uh, course offering isn't tied to a, a particular person. So for our students, it's just part of the regular day. It's what yeah. they do. Yeah, yeah. And we've done a lot of work on the course of studies, the program of studies, to really identify <coughs> what are NCAA approved courses, what are concurrent enrollment courses, what are AP level courses, what are the prerequisites to get into them. We've expanded our Regents, uh, Regents um, Honors yes, offering yes. in ninth grade English this year much modeled after the, the global history transition we've done in the last couple of years. Uh, that's going well so far. So um, 
to, to provide more opportunity access for our students and to, to reduce curriculum. Uh, I'm assuming classes are more academic at this point, right? The basic block and tackle, reading, writing, arithmetic, science. Or TC3. TC3. Are they getting into any um, our, our classes for kids who have a different bent? Like the music stars, the, oh, yeah. the kids who want to on work for NBC Studio, for example. Yeah, yeah, did you, yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll provide you with uh, with our program of studies that outlines all of our, our forensics and science classes, our food science classes, our digital media classes. Um, and they can take any of those, so pretty much if they qualify or whatever. Absolutely, absolutely. Do you know how many of our students are engaged in extracurricular activities in terms of a percentage? I can get the boys on that, uh, but we, we, we've got over over 60 clubs and activities. We've had, uh, I'll get that for you, Nicole. Yeah, it's on the website. It's, it's reported in the area report card, in the report card, in the end of last year, so we can run something by quarter um, and show you where we are currently. Amen. Exactly. Other questions? Jason, you put, to, uh, put together a, a great team. You have your great team here. Um, so what is what's the team need? Uh, do you need uh, we step back from graduation coaches a bit? I mean, do you, is there more? Uh, what else? What else do you need to make it the high school? Yeah, as, I be, as best as you can. Yeah, we're in conversation with that now. We really have to talk about kind of our instructional approaches and, and focus on those pieces and keep the balance of social emotional pieces, the, the anxiety piece. So we're we're now starting conversations about what. Where our structure might look like to meet the students involved. Meet the students. Since we start looking toward next year and budget season and all that, Absolutely. what we certainly look forward to. What can, what is it the high school need? So uh, that's we're at, we're having those conversations now. But, uh, but mental health is a, is, a, is a big issue that we, we need to, to help our students with and our families with. And um, yeah, how, how school looks and, and, and how our response and how our structure make, make some adjustments there. Anything else for Jason before he goes to best booking? <laughs> <laughs> there is a game going on. I mean, it's a. Yes, there is. Well, we're ready. Well, well, we're stuck here, but uh, you're not. <laughs> <laughs> Anything from your team before any opportunity? Any, are you good? <laughs> We're always happy to see you. Always happy to have you come here, and always happy to see you uh, out and about. So. And we're happy to have you. Exactly. So, so we will. We will be visiting. Come on over. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. For the whole board. Thank you. Visit at God. Very good. And David Brown is going to uh, explain lead in the water. No, David, that's not. Right. No, I'm sorry. Uh, I, I got so my brain just goes there. Uh, but David, you are going to talk about fine performing arts, which uh, you have done a tremendous job uh, over the last few years. It was a um, Brad. How long ago was it? Uh, we had conversations about should the should the district. Can the district afford a director of fine performing arts? Oh, and back when we actually had money, was uh, it was decided that we couldn't. But this board, a few years ago, decided we, we need, it's important, we need to do that. We need to have a director of fine performing arts. started before we were on the board. Exactly. Well, it was 15 years they ago. They kept saying no, right. Yeah. They kept saying no. But uh, we eventually said yes, David. And, uh, and I am always. Uh, Impressed when I see the uh, the case before uh, tremendous growth in the uh, in the program. So uh, I took uh, one minute of your thought, but you uh, go for it. Dave. I will try to do five. You're not going to look this way because I know it's going to get that. You're good. Um, I want to start by saying thank you to the Board of Education for allowing me to work within my passion and love, and I have felt such warmth and support as I progressed into the Director of Fine and Performing Arts 10 months ago. So thank you for allowing that to happen. So why the arts? The arts create synapses in the brain. The analytical left hemisphere and the artistic right side of the brain work together to create fireworks in our children's thinking. It increases a person's mental acuity through the study of the arts. Now that being said, we study art, 
music, theater, and dance for the sake of art, music, theater, and dance. But what it does for our children supersedes all of that. We are really lucky right now because the arts are rolling out the new New York State standards in the arts, and these are replacing a 20-year-old uh, set of standards. And I just wanted to give you a few of the, the key, uh, a few of the key takeaways from the new standards. They are pre-K through 12th grade visual arts, music, dance, theater, and a new discipline, media arts. So they added a new one. Um, they are a living set of expectations designed to meet the ever-changing needs of our students to ensure their success in post-secondary education. And this is quote unquote from the, the, the new standards and the workplace. These are created cre to create lifelong learners and contributors to society through the arts. And that's what the arts do. They teach our children to be members of society as a um, active members of society. They're not a curriculum. The standards help us create the curriculum, which help us create benchmarks, which help us create what we teach our children and what our children learn. Um, they are going to be implemented in September of 2018. So they're moving very quickly, unlike some of the other disciplines who have new standards. Half of our staff are already trained in the new arts. Lucky for us, um, I'm actually a facilitator of the new arts, so I've been training them in our curriculum days. Our K-5 art teachers, our K-5 music teachers, and our 412 band teachers have all been trained in the new arts, and the rest of our teachers will be trained throughout the rest of the year, so we're ready to go in, in the fall. Uh, the standards are based on teaching artistic literacy. And the new standards are broken down into four artistic processes and 11 anchor standards. And they are the four processes are creating, performing, presenting, or producing, depending on the discipline, responding, and connecting in the arts. Many states have adopted the National Core Arts Standards. New York State has adapted them. And they felt very strongly that we needed to do more with the connecting. So they, they beefed up the connecting section of the standards. I uh, would love maybe to come to curriculum committee and or another committee and really show what these new standards can do for us. They're very exciting and I know they're a little wieldy when we first start learning about them, but the teachers are very excited once they learn uh, what, what's happening with them. <coughs> In tandem with the new arts standards, we also have our new law, Every Student Succeeds Act. Uh, which replaces no child left behind. And this is, the fundamental premise of the law is that every child be given a well-rounded education inclusive of the arts. Very different from no child left behind. No child left behind used to have the arts teachers looking from the outside. There were core subjects and non-core. And we were always fighting to be part of the team. That every child, uh, every student succeeds at says that we are part of the team because we need to educate the whole child. Here's the interesting thing. The state and the nation have come to where Ithaca City Schools already is, or, or we, where we already are, because we do that. And that's what your vision and mission has been, is that we educate the whole child. So I want to thank you on behalf of all of the arts teachers that we're already there. I want to shift to teaching and learning innovations, and I just want to share a few ideas. Every year, our second grade classes are introduced to the orchestra. This year, the, when the 412 band teachers met, they said, could we do that for the band? So we have set up, and it's just beginning to, to work, and I haven't uh, spoken to Liddy yet, and we need to talk to the principals, but the band teachers would love to have all the third grade students come to Culp and have our high school wind ensemble uh, perform for the students and tell them about the instruments. And I'm going to turn to this camera, and I hope there are a lot of community members who are listening, and say, don't forget, our arts program is for all of our children. And we need to continue to communicate with our community that no child should ever feel like they can't be part of our program. If you can't afford the trumpet in fourth grade, we're going to give you that trumpet. And we're going to give it to you not only in fourth grade, but every day and every month that you need it until the day you walk across the stage at graduation for Ithaca High School or LACS. And that's an important aspect of Ithaca City Schools. No child should ever be turned away from an arts education. Uh, so we're hoping to do that uh, this year also. We're looking at beginning programs throughout our pre-K-12 education also inclusive of the arts. So often, families believe that if we don't start in third grade or once we're done with visual arts in fifth grade, we're done, or seventh grade, and there are all these electives, and it's okay to start in arts education even all the way up to 12th grade. 
We have a young woman who wants to start the violin. I've been working with Bill Macon to try and fit into the schedule uh, the ability of this child to start. It's never too late to start an arts education. We have something that many districts don't have, and that's a composition program. And we, uh, in commendations, tonight, we had two students who won awards for those. Uh, Michael Allen, the Boynton Middle School teacher, has a composer in residence that comes in and works with any student who's interested in doing composition. That's pretty amazing. What I'd like to do is extend that to our other middle school and also our high school in LACS. Performance, uh, Jason had already talked about this, performance-based instruction now is getting uh, credit in GPA and honors credit for our advanced classes. And we continue to work with the Hangar Theater with our fourth grade program. If you don't know what that fourth grade program is, it's teaching through theater. So for instance, we might be learning photosynthesis in fourth grade. The students work together with uh, an arts expert, and they write a play and perform a play about photosynthesis. So we're learning through the arts. Remember, I started talking about uh, the synopsis and everything that happens when we learn through the arts. And it's a pretty exciting program. Social and emotional work through our visual arts. I wanted to, and by the way, I'm going to give Jennifer a lot of links and uh, a PowerPoint from Kelly Bryant, who works at DeWitt, and then she can share those with you. And I just wanted to share her idea of social and emotional well being through visual arts. This is called Who Am I? And what she's asking the students to do is to create art after they talk about what is it to be a seventh grader? What is it to be an 11 year old in the world today? And she asked them, who am I? What do I do with my free time? Draw about that. What do I want to be when I grow up? Do I even know what that is? What do I need to learn? How do I learn? What do I do on the weekend? What is my family like? And how do I create art? So we're not just creating art, but we're creating thinkers through art. And it's pretty exciting. Cultural responsive practices, the arts for all. One of the things we did, I worked with uh, Liddy last summer, and I said, you know, we always provide method books for any student who can't afford a method book. But I'm like, well, we don't do that in other disciplines. If we have math books, we give students math books. Why are we doing this differently? And also, Ithaca City Schools is um, a place where students sometimes don't remain in the same school. So we had students at Fall Creek starting a string program with this method book, and then all of a sudden in January, they're at Cayuga Heights, and they have a different teacher and a different method book. So we piloted a band program this year where all of our fourth, fifth, and sixth graders are all using the same method book. So they're all on the same page looking at benchmarks, and that's what we were talking about, the curriculum this year. How's it going? And they were like, well, we can really talk about benchmarks. This is what we expect fifth graders to know. And also, if somebody joins in sixth grade, here is the same method that somebody was using in fourth grade, or ninth grade or 11th grade. So we piloted with the band. It's going really well, and we're hoping to do that with our third graders next year with our string program. The string teachers will be working on curriculum later this year, and we're going to be looking at a district method book for that. Um, as you know, our high school programs have been exploding. We look at our new choral director. I think this is Kristen's fourth year. When she first started, I think there were 40 students in the high school choir. There are now well over 100 students. We've had to split the bands, the choirs, and the orchestras into two different um, ensembles. But there are some realisms. This is performance-based instruction, and these are the traditional ensemble. So I've been working with Dara Nisi. You might remember Dara from the opening day ceremony. And Dara has proposed, uh, we have proposed, and we talked to Jason, and they've been accepted to go in the new program of studies, two great courses. I'm not going to read the whole thing because I gave that to you, but I want to share it with our community. Music design. This is an electronic music composition class. Students will learn, learn to compose music in a number of genres, including hip hop, dubstep, avant-garde using a program called Reason, and you can read on about that. And then Guitar for All. This is a guitar class for the beginner as well as the pro. We will learn the fundamentals of guitar and how to improvise, comp, shred, and finger pick. We will study different styles, and he will use differentiated instruction if he has a very advanced guitar player or a beginning guitar player. So every student who is interested can have the opportunities that I know that you have at LACS with Dara, and you know any student can go and work with him. And it's a pretty exciting movement, I think, for Ithaca High School that we haven't seen before. Um, Another really great shift for us is when we hired Steve Brookhouse, if you remember, about five years ago. This is my sixth year, and the first year, I think it was about two months in, you said, David, the Hangar Theater is not going to be managing Culp anymore. Ready, go. And we were lucky enough to hire Steve Brookhouse. 
And when we first hired Steve, he had three students that were helping him backstage. And I'm happy to report that this year, Steve has 26 students working on stage crew. And if students from LACS want to also come and work on stage crew, I'm, I know that Steve would love to have you come down and do that because working in the Culp Auditorium is just an amazing experience working with, with those mechanisms. So I just want to congratulate Steve Brookhouse for that, for that incredible work. ICSD participated, and I'm, I'm close to being done, I promise. ICSD participated in the 29th annual, and this year was the 30th annual Human Rights Arts Competition last year, because I think we need to beef up our visual arts program and really give more uh, accolades to them. And I just want to give you some data. Two students from Val Sherman and two students from South Hill, Hill won first place. One student from BJM and one from South Hill won second place. And two from Val Sherman won third place. There were honorable mentions from Val Sherman and South Hill. Middle school students from Boynton LACS took several places. And two students from IHS took second and third. Class awards for visual art went to first grade at Val Sherman and second grade at BJM. And I think that is fabulous. And there were many, many art teachers who participated. And you will see some of the work around the room. And I love that we have artwork throughout our board building. And we will continue to do that. I'm really excited. No, this is not uh, in its final stages, but we are working at diversifying our staff by hiring our guest, a guest clin clinician, Dr. Baruch Whitehead from Ithaca College, who's going to come in and work with every fifth grade class in our district, all eight schools. He will be teaching his original work, Peace Cantata, culminating in a district-wide concert in June of 2019. He will work with every fifth grade student. We will be moving him into each of the fifth grade classes. And it's a collaboration of music teachers, art teachers, and classroom teachers. They just don't know it yet, the classroom teachers, so now I guess it is known. Um, and this is a one-year exploratory project through arts and education and some grant work and district initiatives. I want to welcome uh, Rebecca DeLubach, our new elementary art teacher, Nicole Federtech, elementary music, Audrey Moss, elementary strings, and Ashley Quick, middle school art. Um, and finally, I just want to talk about a couple great happenings in our district. You already shared LACS's amazing Midsummer Night's Dream under the tutelage of um, Nettie Swen Simons. And to see Shakespeare run by students and, uh, did I say his name wrong? Okay. I think it's Natty. Natty, thank you. I can't read my hand. I know put these on. Yes. <laughs> Natty Simpson, thank you. Yes. Um, but to see them costume and direct and act, it's pretty incredible. And you had the opportunity to do that this weekend because, as you said, Ithaca High School is doing their one-act plays. They're about 10 minutes long each. I think there's four or five of them. Students pick the play, they cast the play, and they direct the play all under the leadership of um, uh, Lorraine Tino. We are collaborating with Ithaca College this year. As you know, our, one of our private schools closed. And that private school actually housed Ithaca College junior student teachers. And they reached out to us to see if we could possibly house the junior student teaching experience. And we're doing that through Ithaca City Schools. So we're collaborating back and forth. And that's pretty exciting. And Dr. James and I are getting the opportunity, because I'm helping them with this whole process, bringing the opportunity to meet many students, uh, some diverse students. And and we're looking at, you know, possibly trying to convince them to stay in this area. I, I couldn't do a report like this if I didn't thank the Fine Arts Booster Group and their amazing work through um, the subsidiary of IPEI. Already, they have donated 12 instruments through the Play It Again program, and they're in the students' hands except for one electric guitar, which we haven't put in a student's hand yet. Uh, and for our community to know that if you're moving or cleaning and you find somebody's trumpet or clarinet or violin under the bed, think about donating to the school. And it looks like we may have a piano that DeWitt is looking for donated next week. We're really excited about that program. Um, and there's more that the Fine Arts Booster Group does, including $8,000 donation to help 485 students in need most recently. And I know you get those reports all the time, but I think it's important this community knows what the Fine Arts Booster Group does. They've, in my time, since I've been here, well over a quarter of a million dollars helping uh, arts education. Um, Kelsey Boyce, I just want to talk about one thing with her, and then I will leave you for questions. And I want to mention that she teaches at elementary band in her second year at Enfield and BJM and at the high school because the program is so large we need a little help at the high school for one day. And 
it's incredible for the first time that I know of, and it's my sixth, this is my sixth year, she started students at Enfield and every one of those students are now in fifth grade and continued. And I've never seen 100% student retention, and especially at Enfield. I'm so excited. That band program has probably tripled, and to have that retention is pretty huge. And with that, I will leave you. There's a lot more I want to share with you, but I don't know how long that was. But thank you. Thank you, David. And go ahead. Well, uh, just, a couple, just a couple comments. One is congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> and also thank you for your, your wonderful enthusiasm. I really appreciate all that passion. And I just also just have one question. Please. Um, and um, in terms of like visual arts and elementary, where do you see your that going or working on in particular? Well, I think right now we're trying to work with the standards, the new standards and writing K-5 curriculum, looking at case study work. If you look at the case study page on the, the district page, you'll see a lot of art teachers are already collaborating with teachers working on case studies. And I think right now that is our foremost work is to you know, envelop the new standards in what we already do. And we're not going to change our practice, but it may inform our practice. Okay. Thank you. Oh. I'm excited about the uh, the courses. I mean, you and I talked about that before. Just could you talk a little bit more about the um, opportunities those two courses offer from your perspective to diversify who gets into the flow? I think what it does is it gives us the opportunity to communicate and attract students who are not traditionally in our music program. You know, as I take over the presidency of the New York State School Music Association, I'm, I'm seeing some very similar trends that we see here in Ithaca City Schools in every district across the, strip, the state. And one of the things my predecessor uh, president, he's actually about to become past president, is he has been working with emerging ensembles. What is it that we're not seeing in music education that changes with the times? So there are many different ways that we can educate through music and art. And you know, I work with Carol Spence at the high school too. And what offerings don't we have? We have to be careful that we don't saturate our students with too many offerings that we, we lose some of the uh, opportunities, uh, especially with an eight period class, uh, eight period schedule. You know, there's only so much they can do. But I think these are opportunities that students who aren't in our program probably haven't been. And we'll be talking to the eighth graders. And Dara is, he's like a minstrel himself. So I know he has already talked about once these are approved, which Jason and I have already moved those forward, he's going to be going out and talking to students. You know, maybe it's simply in the cafeteria and you know, making these announcements. But we have a lot of communication to do to let students know that these are available. And I, I hope that our representatives will also share that as student council and all the other ways that we can let students know that these are there. My fear, actually, is that there's going to be too many students who are going to sign up. And we only have Dara for one period. So I'm not sure what that's going to be, because he definitely needs to be the person that does this work. I think it's going to be, yes, I hope it's oversubscribed. And I almost would bet that it's going to be uh, kids knocking down the door. I mean, their generation knows. You know, Jay-Z has put more words in the English language now than Shakespeare. Right? You have young people doing things in hip hop, they call them the Mozarts of hip hop. Yeah? Yep. Rural people who have always been exceptional, created three forms of music. So just having more opportunities for kids to get in. It's one thing for a kid to assimilate and do something in another musical space. It's a completely different thing for that kid to be empowered to be a genius in the thing he actually loves and craves. I couldn't agree more. So I'm, I'm, I just can't wait to see how these classes fill up. And, and I'll be honest, it's because of Dara. I mean, this is a, a strength of his. If you all of a sudden said to me, you know what, David, I want you to go back into the classroom and you're going to teach these two classes. I, we're, we're just not trained. You know, a lot of people say, well, why are these the, the classes that represent programs throughout the state and the country? Well, that's how we're trained. I was, I've never taken a hip hop class. So if you ask me, would you teach hip hop? I mean, it would be a disaster. So that we have his expertise, knowledge, and passion is going to, I think, help drive this. And maybe in the future, if it gets big enough, we have to talk about how we use Dara and hopefully continue to share him between two great communities. 
Chris, go ahead. <clears throat> well, two things. First, you started out thanking us, and um, I think the community can see that we need to thank you for your passion and your commitment to this district and, and to our children. So thank you. Um, what you spoke about, you know, the collaboration with the um, junior students at IC mm -hmm. and the potential for keeping them, what is our need right now as far as teachers and educators? Our, our program continues to grow, so uh, we do need to probably increase a tad. In, I don't know that yet because we, our, uh, the equity report card and all of our data is still coming in. I'm getting the data from the band teachers and the orchestra teachers and the chorus teachers. I don't have a direct response like we need 1.4 to this, 1.4 to that. I think we're going to need a little and uh, I will know more as we progress through the next six weeks if that's what you're asking me. I, wasn't, I don't know if that's the that's question. Yeah. Okay. Um, as everyone else, I'm going to start off by saying congratulations and thank you for bringing, thank you for reprising this role. And whenever you talk about the program, you're always super duper excited compared to some people that do their presentations and they're like really nervous. You can tell them love I'm what so you nervous. do and you're just like. Rrr, 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 rrr. I, I can't even remember my questions because you've just been talking so much um, about how, how much you love the program um, and the work that you do. Uh, um, one question I have is do you think that um, as a district or specifically in your department that we can do a better job at letting parents or students know that no child will um, be turned away because as we spoke um, just a few weeks ago um, with all the papers that go home it's really hard to know that when you're like reading through so many papers you're making dinner you're trying to make sure your child has done their homework. Um, I'm just wondering if we can send out maybe We're an email not, or a letter home of, at the beginning of the school year to let parents and students know that no child will be turned away. Thank you. Yes, we need to do a better job. We've done a great job, but it's not a good enough job. Uh, one of the things that we were collaborating as in a department, and one of my teachers says, what if we put something in the report cards? And we put some kind of note in every report card saying something to the effect of you will not be turned away. I, I think there is a perception that the arts are for the elite. And to counteract that perception is very, very difficult. And we've done a good job, but we can do it better. So we need to let this community know, all of us, when we talk to people, that this is how we do it. Because it isn't a known fact. And as many times as I say it at every concert, those are the people that are already there. So we need to talk to the second graders. When those second graders, and that's why the band teachers, that was their, their idea. Let's get all the third graders into cult. And we will tell them, go home and tell your caregivers, we will support. Because when the child goes home, they usually say, mom, I want to play the cello. And it's like, cello, that's got to be thousands of dollars. We can't do it. And sometimes it can't be. But if we really, really communicate to them, they go home. And Mr. Brown was on the stage and he says, don't worry about it, we don't have to pay for that cello. Because we know that that's the communication that gets dropped. Because a lot of times, no, we're not doing that. And we want to make sure. We also, I've talked to Susan Eschbach about possibly looking at, and this is just um, an idea, what if every third grade student at BJM started a string instrument? What would that look like, and how would we do it? And what would that do to our, and we don't do it for that reason, but let's think about it. what would that do to our literacy, and what would that do to our math skills if that was just a component of every third grade student, and should we pilot that? And then there isn't a question about, well, we can't afford the program. You are in the program. So I think there are many ways we can do this. I haven't figured out the, the solution, because there are still a lot of people in this community that we haven't educated and empowered to be in the program. So, so I'm open to lots of ideas. I had one comment, but not two quick comments. One, I want to just reaffirm what Eldred said in terms of trying to not always start from a base that is a traditional Eurocentric model. So maybe it's not the strings, maybe it's something else that speaks to children, but the idea of putting a music instrument in every child's hand may be a good idea, but I think that part was key. And I think Nicole's part is also key as well. What I heard from the Link crew in the high school was um, multiple outreach efforts. And so maybe um, right, we're doing great work. We have a phenomenal, pro an amazing program, a state-recognized 
program. Um, but that kind of outreach and that continual outreach is absolutely a necessity. So phone calls, home may be something to be considering, right? Beyond mailings, but, but thinking about multiple ways to do it. Um, because I know our equity report card clearly has a differential between various households of who participates in our program and who does not. And so that, but that's on us. That's not on carrier, carriers or parents that we have to do more outreach. But thank you for the work you're doing, and hopefully we'll be able to get more of that outreach going on in the future. I hope so. Thank you. Excellent uh, discussion questions. David, we'll let you go, but uh, thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And we're going to keep rolling into not quite as exciting as um, it's the time of year. music, but budget. Uh, no, budget. no, I'm going to try. I'm going to try to keep it as exciting Process and as brief. You um, need to see you shake like you did. <laughs> Um, so this is this is a little bit earlier than we've um, we've sort of kicked off budget season in the past, but it's actually a good time of year to do that because um, it's kind of timed up pretty nicely for uh, where we are in the process. Again, tonight is just about process. It will be a very brief presentation. As you all know, we've sat through these meetings before. There is much more to come from me, so I'll become a familiar face to those that tune in at home. And if you want to come to any of the meetings that we offer all throughout um, the year around budget, obviously everybody's welcome. Um, especially student voices, you know, community partners, all that. We would love to have people at the table um, and giving their input on these decisions. Um, we try to make this every year a little bit better than the prior. We try to make it a little bit more transparent, although if it's transparent, it should be see-through from the beginning, but we have found that oftentimes um, when we strive to be transparent, we may not do all the best we can in communication. So it's not that we're, I think we've achieved transparency, but I think the communication can always improve, right? So that's sort of the pieces that we'll always be working on. So with that said, I just sort of want to give an overview of a little bit of um, what the process uh, for a typical district, especially Ithaca, um, goes through. A lot of things are prescribed by the state, but a lot of there's a lot of uniqueness to us here in Ithaca. And so um, there's obviously some key dates that are prescribed for us, key dates that we create um, as a community, and then the budget priorities. Some are shared across the state, some are very specific to us. Um, so depending on, you know, um, the sort of lens you take, um, there's always going to be a priority for everyone um, when it comes to the budget. So people who think that, oh, the budget, I don't really need to tune in. Quite frankly, this really is almost the, the nuts and bolts and the circulatory system behind it all, right? Um, so Jen, um, just want to talk a little bit about our process. Um, we currently, right now, um, there's two budget development processes that have already started. Um, obviously, we have feedback all the way throughout the year. People come back and September, um, they tell us the things that we maybe missed during the budget development process, so that already began. Over the summertime, we've met with principals, we've hired new staff, we've made sure to meet the needs of any special education students. I mean, this is a constant process, but we're developing for the 18-19 budget already. And so budget developers are folks like principals and directors. Um, they're the ones who really manage teams, manage staff, they manage um, funds that go along with that, whether it be equipment, supplies, overtime. Time, right benefits costs and so right now in the hands of our principals and directors as well as exec team members there are two budgets there are general fund budget that will eventually go out to the voters their building or, or program specific budgets as well as the BOCES budget so our budget, as many remember, the largest component is salary and fringe, and the second largest component is BOCES. Um, so really, you know, that's that's really the next, and then the next would be debt service. So um, the, the BOCES budget is quite large, and we want to make sure that we get a lot of feedback. This year we're doing something a little bit differently. Um, we have the BOCES, uh, I guess they call it the road show, that comes to the exec team. They give us our sort of uh, catalog of everything that they offer. Um, as we were debriefing that, we decided that this year we really don't want to actually do our individual tab on the BOCES budget and complete that. We actually wanted to work together in one room and really look at BOCES comprehensively. You know, if we have EAP, are we also addressing the mental health needs of young people while they're over at the Smith School? or, you know, over in career and tech and in um, the alternative schools there. What are they doing that might be innovative that we can learn from? And so we really, as an exec, exec team, decided that we're going to try to do that in a more collaborative fashion. It'll be the first time that we sort of tweak that and move that again um, for that, um, with that sort of spirit in mind. 
After that, those recommendations come in from the exec team, from the budget developers and the principals and the directors. Obviously, there's a give and take. And these are in blocks, but this really is a lot of fluidity that goes back and forth sort of between these blocks. I card them out to sort of show the different types of stakeholders, but this process can ebb and flow backward and forward. Obviously, there are deadlines with certain development aspects of the budget, but those deadlines oftentimes are, um, unless there are a hard deadline set by like a BOCES, we have the ability all the way through the process when the board adopts the budget in late April to be able to sort of have the movement back and forth between these partners. So as you can see, there's a lot of development from the business office sort of creates the document kind of that um, will allow for the conversation to occur. The executive team has input in that obviously because we have probably a higher level picture of the district as a whole. The, obviously the, the budget developers in terms of the building levels and the program levels will give us input. We have community stakeholder feedback. They have a different vantage point on the budget and what that means. We define stakeholder anywhere again from teacher. Um, we've done PD sessions with them. Um, we have uh, paraprofessionals and employees association. We're hoping to do some PD for them. That'll be new this year to get their feedback on the budget process. Um, and then also a lot of community groups. Dr. Brown really has um, since he came here, really tried to open up the dialogue in terms of inviting people that are community partners to the table to give feedback. We also, a few years ago, started a lot of what we call roadshows, you know, to PTAs. And many of the board members either do them themselves, they join us, we go alone, the principals um, ask for information, and then they turn it over. And so it's really been a fantastic process to be able to interact with exec team, board, and PTAs, and principals, um, and teaching staff to be able to to sort of um, give that out to the community. And then finally, it lands in the hands of the Board of Ed after much conversation at committee level, community level, stakeholder meeting level, and then obviously we hope to have an analysis and adoption done again by that state mandated deadline in April. So the next slide is sort of the key dates. Some of these, again, prescribed by the state. Others are really ones that we have sort of generated and we want to keep ourselves um, on track. Um, Jen does a wonderful job of sort of pulling together, again, that budget calendar that was approved a few uh, meetings ago. That's sort of a guidance document for us. Again, though, <coughs> things need to change. People aren't ready. We need more information. That can grow and evolve as necessary. But as you can see, we sort of have um, a, a little bit of a kind of growth value in terms of the information that's coming to us as it gets sort of secure and solidified, either from the state level, our tax cap calculation, there are factors that aren't given to us until a certain amount of time or date um, specific, so we can't do calculations. We can kind of do assumptions, but we want to make sure that we get like the real numbers in order, and so it just sort of gets um, from sort of a larger kind of scope to a real narrow, like we can land in this range and know for sure that this is what's going to be our levy, or this this is what's going to be our state aid amounts. The revenue drives the expenditures. So whatever we bring in in terms of revenue, that's going to set sort of our goals for what our expenditures should be. Um, Along with that, obviously, we're looking at our fund balance and reserve to see how that, if we need to use that to balance. And any of the community outreach sessions, that also helps us determine our priorities, right? Because those are, although we all know that we have levers and we have um, goal statements and we have sort of things that we really want to continue to grow and nurture, um, there are also very specific um, needs that come our way on any given year, whether it be last year was ENL, years before it was pre-K, right? So we, we try to keep that dialogue going and, and an informed budget process. And you sort of can see that the sort of um, the communication pieces are sort of put into that. And then obviously, everything will go out to vote um, in the middle of May. And that's, again, a prescribed date and time. Typically, when we go out to vote, it's for the vote for um, what we can levy for taxes um, and the amount of um, money that um, essentially it's not the, the, the levy is, is part of the budget documents. But we're asking for a certain amount of money that we could spend to support the expenditures um, to to support the operations of the district. And we also have propositions along with that as well. We always go out to the voters with um, our capital reserve monies so that we know what we spend on buses and any cap projects um, that we might do over the summer. 
So Jen, the next slide is just, again, a sort of a reiteration of those priorities. As I've already stated, we have the revenue pieces. Those will come in based on that calendar, the very simplistic calendar that I just showed you. They'll drive sort of where we know we'll be in terms of our spending. Um, that's, you know, we'll be doing all the work in advance of that to analyze salary and benefits and the most, you know, the biggest part of the benefits line is the health insurance. We've made some changes over the course of time, so we'll be looking at that and seeing um, how those decisions have played out in terms of a budgetary standpoint. Um, we'll be looking again at the BOCES budget and debt service um, as we look forward to any capital projects that will be coming our way um, or that we've been wrapping up, such as the energy performance contract. Um, or uh, you know any other um, smaller capital projects that we've embedded into the budget. The fund balance, we do, we've spent a lot of time as a community talking about that, building an education around that, the need for that, where our goals would be in terms of our savings goals and then our utilization goals of those savings goals and then the rebuilding of those savings goals after utilizing them. Um, so we'll be doing that as well in a number of our um, presentations. And then finally, any other elements. Right now, if you um, attend uh, finance and facilities committee meetings, we've been spending a lot lot of time, and rightfully so, on the building condition survey, which should be a tool that districts utilize to drive decision making around the buildings themselves. Um, what is needed? Are there health and safety items? Are there ADA compliance issues that we want to address or do better? Um, are there things that, you know, buildings that just look tired and need a little bit of work or a little bit of sort of care to them? Are there innovations that we need to do? Are there classroom spaces that need to be updated? Are we thinking about the way that we are teaching and learning and what those spaces look like. So you can sort of see from the necessity to sort of the innovation, we'll be talking about that a lot. And obviously you need funding to be able to drive that. So we're, we're sort of managing past, moving into future, and the trends around those pieces. And then obviously always program management and growth, as I spoke to before. What is the next thing that we really need to focus on? Will it be special education? Will it be the facilities? Will it be transportation? And balancing all of those things while supporting the general operations um, based on our bargained agreements um, and all of that. So that's really a synopsis. Um, obviously, it was it's brief and quick, but um, again, it's still early in the sense of the budget development. So I just wanted to be able to give the public and the board sort of a, a reminder of where where we're coming from and where we're going and sort of where we are right now, um, and know that uh, you know the. The finance committee meetings are a really great place to have conversations um, in depth. We try to then represent those at the board meetings. Um, each month you'll be seeing me try to keep them brief. Sometimes they go a little long, I do know that, but um, you know, sometimes I think the topics do need a little bit more time. So we'll be balancing that along with all the other things that the board has to consider. So welcome to budget 2019. We're not ready to adopt, I guess. Uh, not yet, not yet. Oh, yeah. A little too soon. Oh, just, we can uh, go back a slide. So yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I think a motion right now is good. So, there we are. Questions for Amanda? Anything? Brad, go ahead. Because I like this chart. Um, makes things easy to understand. Appreciate it. Um, I think one thing that the board needs to know and be cognizant of has to do is now with the general fund, the special fund, and to do with grant monies. The titles. Our title funds. Our title two money was cut in half this year. Yes. That drives um, professional development. development. So that's going to put and is currently zeroed out in the proposed federal budget. <clears throat> so. We won't have to worry about how big the cut is. It'll just go to zero. Mm -hmm. um, so that'll provide some pressure on the general fund budget to use general fund dollars for some of that PD. So you should be aware of that. And I don't know where they're headed on Title I. Um, it, the current proposal would have that dramatically cut as well. And that will, again, put more pressure on the general fund budget uh, because we have a number of uh, FTEs that are paid through that uh, title budget. Um, so just folks should know what's going on with the federal budget and how that's going to impact us. Um, it'll put pressure on the general on the general fund. And you know, I'll, Dan, I'll let you give the good news. On the let you give the good <laughs> just news to on add the state to that, I just there's going to be a lot of uncertainty. And um, just to. Um, uh, acknowledge that our own congressperson, Congressman Reed, in fact voted 
um, for the uh, GOP tax uh, uh, cut bill that will create uh, quite a large deficit, which will then in turn put a lot of pressure on monies that then go for education, go for the arts, for just about anything else you can imagine, for Medicare. <coughs> so I think um, there are all kinds of things that are going to be changing dynamically in the state, where the state's going to have to be picking up stuff that the government <coughs> formerly were doing. Um, if uh, income taxes are no longer deductible, which looks like that's going to come to pass, then there's, an if st if there's limitations on how much school taxes and local taxes are deductible for people. That's going to change the dynamic all over the state. So um, I would say, I don't know, it could be an interesting uh, budget year. And, <coughs> yeah. So I try not to get too panicked early on. Um, I think we've really tried to use logic, sometimes even when logic is not appropriate, <laughs> because it just yeah. seems illogical. Yeah. Um, but I think, you know, we've done such a good job at building um, a real vocabulary around budget and a real um, understanding of budget, especially with our budget developers and our community stakeholders. That you know, I'm. I think I think we're really well prepared to have difficult conversations if necessary because people are already they already have that language to be able to sit and sort of understand what it is that we're talking about. So we, we actually can jump right into sort of the, you know, here are the factors, let's analyze them, what should we do about it? And we don't actually, we can do a little bit of the deep, the, the briefing or the sort of revisiting of these are what the terms are, right? Because I think that people have been very attentive um, to sort of these trends. <coughs> PD, the only thing, Brad, that I wanted to couple with that is, I know I can speak for Lydia as well, that we have done a lot of work of building in professional development as part of our bargaining agreements. I know. So we built a program where we've enhanced that, and now we're getting you know that cut. So it's going to be difficult. Plus, it's going to be pressure on the general fund. That's right. That's right. Anything else for Amanda right now? Uh, Eat, go ahead. You, sound, <coughs> you, you sounded wonderfully excited, Water. first of all. Thank you. <laughs> Water. Thanks. Favorably compared to Mr. Brown on any night. And before you know, these conversations, I was going to uh, ask a different question. In the past, we've kind of played around with the idea of coming to the budget sessions understanding what's so important to us that we know it's going to have a significant impact on the budget, right? From a child-based perspective, an academic perspective. And every time we almost, we can see it, somebody pulls a rug out from under us. Hmm. I'm wondering if it's still possible to try to focus on it, even if it doesn't happen, right? Rearranging all the schools, doing all the work in buildings, I and mean, that's a different, that's a different scope, right? That would be in a different, maybe that would be in the bond, maybe that would be in some of the other things. But we develop a sense through this process of what Dr. Brown and you, as his executive team, want to do with the kids. That's going to have some significant impact financially, and it would just be nice to be on the same page going into one of the budget sessions about what that is. Well, I, you know, Dr. Brown has been doing a really, I think, an excellent exercise with us of sort of thinking about, you know, what's moving the needle, right? And so, you know, we, we do that all year long. And um, I think that he's been pushing us as a team to do a lot of evaluation mm -hmm. of sort of, you know, what just because we've always done something this way, is this the way that we should be doing it tomorrow? Mm -hmm. And you know, is this is this the time? What's the data telling us? What is the, you know, is this if this is proven effective, then we could, should continue, and we, that's obviously going to remain a priority, or maybe um, it's going to remain something that's funded, right? right. Things that we've always been doing just because we've always been doing it, but it's not moving the needle or it's no longer a priority or it's just, you know, I think that that's where, um, you know, this this idea of uh, building trust with um, 
all of the stakeholders, and when I say stakeholders, I mean everybody that gets a paycheck from Ithaca City School District to those that pay the tax bill from Ithaca, right, to those that are partners with us. And, and I do, when I say that, I, I really mean it, that I think that we've come a really long way of having a network that people come together to help give input into that evaluation. And then it's not so scary when we talk about change, or we talk about shifting, or we talk about you know like um, evolving from where we were to where we want to be. And I, I don't know. I think the team would speak the same way. I feel like we've done a lot of work on that. And um, even in just the four years I've been here, I think I've noticed people sort of like being willing to sort of at least just listen. Right and talk. Now they may not. It may not. They may not feel good at the end because if the ultimate decision, you know, is that this isn't what we want to continue, right? Um, but we definitely have the abilities to bring people together. I, don't know. I think we meet about weekly you know, to have strategic conversation. And one of the things I'm sharing with folks is, uh, see, my, my experiences have taught me that budget processes should be the same whether or not you have money to spend or you're trying to cut four million dollars. Right. And we need to have a process that's consistent. So we talk about this quadrant analysis, uh, which puts um, on a continuum our community's uh, value of a particular program or initiative or line item from somewhat value to very much value. And then another axis that shows uh, impact on student achievement, minimal to significant. Mm -hmm. And there's some things that are in that top right quadrant that we know impact achievement every day in our community values, i.e. the arts and co-curricular programs. Yes. It's why this board chose to increase those opportunities for young people when most districts in our state was cutting them right. when we were facing a crisis. But there are also programs in that bottom left quadrant uh, that, are, that have minimal impact on student achievement and also aren't valued as much by our community. And programs and people that oftentimes land there are things such as uh, uh, a, a technology program that's been here for decades that only a few young people are using but costs us hundreds of thousands of dollars. Mm -hmm. or a people-driven program that isn't helping student achievement, but actually in some ways in, impacting it negatively. We've had those tough conversations over the years, and now we're, and it's been a hard conversation for my, our exec team to sit down, we don't have to have this yet, because um, we're not facing a uh, potential of going over the tax cap or $18 million budget deficit like some of our colleagues are, or if we, you know, and we may be looking to add programs. So we're having that conversation now to get a sense of what do we truly value and what, how did that community um, support it? That, that's, a, that's, a, that's, I'm sure all of us just smiled inside and said, wow, that's pretty cool, right? But that's an inventory project. It's almost like, what do we have in the closet? I meant something um, maybe a little more proactive, right? So you've, he's laid down the bar to us, saying our leaders now, right? For progress, our culture responsive. Education, tier one reading program, I can't remember what the third one is, right? So I just walk around, you know, between meetings thinking if those are that critical to us, we're going to see some significant budgetary impact, right? That comes that that's necessary to move those levers. Well maybe maybe that's not. Maybe it's that's more moving people in the right seats on the bus. I don't know, but I, I'm trying to get a connection between yeah. what we say is important in certain periods and what that across the board impact on our budgetary, what's the significant budgetary impact of moving those levels. So we got to talk, sense? Yeah, and we got, and I, I'm, I'm happy that we're having this conversation tonight, but also that we'll move towards talking about it more macro. We're spending $21,000 per kid, $120 million. From my perspective, we built that budget to support those levels. And if we start thinking about individual programs or individual budget initiatives, then that's the wrong conversation. And I, as I think about, you know, we're, the district uh, passed a hundred plus million dollar bond initiative 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. um, and tonight I talked about culturally responsive teaching practices and spaces. As we're going throughout our building, we're seeing <laughs> everything from the seats the young people are sitting in to how we're organized in buildings is an impact of that bond project years ago. Um, and the people that we're, that we're bringing in now, we asked some questions about how their experiences with cultural responsive teaching practices and if they understand and appreciate and can recognize inclusive practices. And you saw that accommodations tonight. So I, I, from my perspective, our key levers are embedded in everything we do with the $128 million. And I would caution us against 
thinking about it as one program, one person, and saying if there's going to be an impact on our budget, that's going to impact that level today or differently. I hope we have that conversation about each one of the things we talk about. Yeah. And to add to that too, I think, I think you were the one last year that really pushed and, and you know, I think we all agreed that you cannot, we cannot do budget planning for the next year, right? Yes. So I think every time, you know, when I'm hearing you talk about like sort of the levers and like what that means, I think we all, have, we have to continue to get into the practice and ensure that we're checking one another on the fact that we're not just talking about fiscal year 2019, that this, whatever it is or where we want to evolve to, that this very well may be a conversation that in year one, this is what the budget is, and then year two, we'd like to grow that budget line by this much or decrease it so that then that money could go to this. So I, I think that idea of the multi-year budgeting, right, over at least a two-year, if not three, right, and, I, and we got there last year. We were really trying to talk about year one, year two. We sort of took some things that were priorities, step them back just a little bit because we said, you know what, we can't feasibly do this all in year one. There's no way to sustain that. We would need to be able to look at this in a multi-year approach. So I, I think that the way to get at what you're talking about with a true sustainability mindset is to not do it just for fiscal year 19. So the budget development process, and you know, I think that's sort of, you have to check me on that too, is to make sure that we're continuing to talk about not just next year, but the years, you know, maybe two years out or three years out. Because I think that that's how, I think, living in New York State, in the school, um, you know, in state education world especially, to think of anything in a one-year term anymore is almost impossible. And I think it actually, slow, there's some intentionality to slow us down and make sure we're doing it right so that it is for the long term. So I think, I think you know, I'm glad you brought that up because I, I didn't put that on the slide. I think that we need to think of the multi-year approach. Anything else for Amanda? We shall see you. Frequently. Well, next week, probably. Perhaps, yeah. yeah. I mean, I'll be around. Okay. <laughs> Thanks, all. Thanks. Thanks, Amanda. So we're going to roll into uh, revisions of a policy, perhaps, for first reading. Uh, sure. Uh, there are three policies on the agenda this evening. The first one is an update to the domestic field trip policy. Uh, I think we, Liddy is here in the room, who is... Uh, one of the co-authors of this section that we're trying to have a conversation about. You may recall that we passed the international field trip policy probably two years ago um, and doing some work uh, Liddy was going through and realizing and maybe some other folks as well that uh, we were requiring an approval process for international trips um, but we had no approval process for domestic trips even while they may travel farther than some of our international trips um, and that uh, they may stay overnight as well. And so the section you see is just this part. Um, the, the only change to this policy is the part that's underlined, which is a, an approval process that says two things, um, primarily the changes, is one, if you have an overnight trip or if you're beyond 50 miles, that you need to notify central office. It's not an a quote unquote approval per se. Um, it's much more of a notification, though with the option of saying, hey, hold on, let's not do that, let's ask more questions. But the idea is to give principals and central office um, uh, an opportunity to have some additional questions given some of the nature of some of our trips. Did I capture that? Yes. We need to know where you are. Yes. So we made that clear to all our building uh, leaders, right. the parameters and when you should get input. If you're not sure, you should check with us to be sure we're safe. It is. Are, I mean, are athletics and music and arts exempted from this, or are they part of it? I mean, athletics travels 50 miles for league games <laughs> in a number of cases. Sure. I think this way in which this is defined is strictly as field trips, okay. and to make sure that field trips also have, one of the things we're also trying to check is make sure there was an educational mission yeah. to the field trips. From my perspective, I would say that that does not apply to our sports teams, but I could be way off. This doesn't per se, but all 
athletic trips get vetted through our athletic director and our that department and so that there is a district level person saying, yes, I know where these trips are going. Yeah. Right, the bus is leaving at this hour and yes. should return at this hour. Right. And, and if it doesn't, right, we right. know who to contact right. and then how to get to Exactly. And Brad, I was thinking another concern was just on that issue is that sometimes our field trips are also engaged in signing contracts or contracting services. And so the idea was really to also have another step in the process before you start signing off on things. Let's have a, let's have a conversation about what that looks like. Gotcha. Okay. So I move this for a first reading. I move policy 4531.1, domestic field trips for a first reading. Second. So I'm Pat. Any any other questions? All in favor? That's everyone, and Eldred has stepped out. Great. I'll come back your way momentarily. Uh, the next policy is the policy that the board had some conversation about a couple weeks ago. This is a policy about the administration of epinephrine in our schools. Um, I will also send out, uh, Kathy sent out some information earlier uh, to Jennifer and, and the policy committee in regards to our um, the uh, orders that we have per building for epinephrine to be stored, as well as the actual usage for 2015 to 2017. And if I'm not mistaken, there's been just under 10 times it's been administered in our school buildings. I think I thought if I counted nine times from 2015 to 2017. The policy we tried to write said, if I can simplify and you can read the language and decide for yourself if it says that, that uh, trained medical professionals can uh, administer epinephrine to any student who has an order for that to happen and our trained medical professionals can administer epinephrine to anyone who does not have an order but, see, but appears to be in, um, in athletic shock. That's what the policy is intended to say. Perfect. Intended to say. Does it indeed say that? Well, I, Kate did a great job of talking about language saying that we will administer epinephrine in keeping with state law, which I thought was a good way to phrase it. So. Um, but that's what we're trying to accomplish okay. with this in keeping with state law act aspect. Very good. Questions? Anyway. So I move policy 5420, administration of epinephrine of suspected anaphylactic sh shock for a first reading. Second. Second by Pat. Any other? Brad, go ahead. So we're now going to what? To keep epinephrine? Non-specific. We already do. We already do. So we, this is this is in essence keeping with our current practice. Okay. We're already engaged in this current practice as now. So what we're doing is just writing a policy that keeps that. We did not extend it. The other thing that we could have done is saying that non-medical trained professionals can also administer epinephrine. That we have chosen at this point in time not to do by saying. Um, medical that, that came with a training program? The possibility, but people can volunteer for training, right. right? And so some classroom teachers, bus drivers, but according to the data I read, that has not happened as of this point in time, that, that has not been administered. Is that also what I read, Kath? We, we currently have, we do not have any, any documentation that a non-medical person has, has administered it in the past. We are currently training um, teachers or uh, chaperones, primarily teachers, uh, to administer patient-specific. So we've, uh, doctors identified this this child has it and has an order and provides medication. Yeah. Does that make sense? That means non. That means trained non-medical professionals are able to administer to students who have an order. Patient-specific. Patient-specific. And we have it in every building. And that's what we currently have in place anyway. Yes. So we're simply having a policy saying that we can store it in our buildings and we'll be current, adopting our current practice. Anything else for a first reading? All in favor? That's everyone. Now, our next policy is um, intended to do almost the exact same thing. There may be some questions because I have a question myself. But the idea being that trained medical professionals um, would be able to administer naloxone for anyone who appears to be uh, under the, go the guise of opioid, opioid overdose. That's the intent. Though I have a question as well. Uh, Kathy's here. I'm going to ask Michael. Oh, go you go. No, no, I can wait. Well, I, I just had one question. I was reading it earlier, and it's like the, I think the last line is they think a city school district shall encourage school nurses to complete the training 
I was just wondering about the shell. I mean, whether or not we should do more than shell, whether should actually provide it. Because you actually don't have you don't provide it. Mm -hmm. So my my understanding is that there is a component of that training that's actually required for orders to maintain licensure in New York State. Mm -hmm. So Kathy's nodding her head in, in affirmance, so that's good. So this is something that every school nurse would be getting as part of their state-mandated training in any event. Um, so it's not training the district would necessarily compel, but it would be part of their, uh, we, we'd expect most nurses would be getting the ordinary course. So, um, and that's one of the benefits to keeping the policy confined to medical professionals administering the Loxone as opposed to broadening it to non-medical professionals. So they can do non-specific naloxone to students or staff. So the caregiver who presents at 2 o'clock at a school building and appears to be overdosing, we dial 911? Dial 911. The other question is actually what we could look at is um, whether we could yep. have a physician order, a general physician order, that actually can extend that beyond just students and staff to, to also community members under a general physician's order. Um, it would only apply to, cert, to, to um, other medical professionals. So we couldn't extend that to non-medical professionals. But I think that the physician standing order would be sufficient to allow Kathy and any other trained nurse to be able to administer naloxone to community members in addition to we'll staff to and students property. who are presenting with signs of that. Yes. Yes, and, and that's something we're happy to take a look at a uh, second reading. We are trying to find what's the way in which that we can at least cover everyone that was under the purview of the district. No, currently, we don't have it. I mean, we do we have it currently in our medical offices? Yes, we do. We currently have it in our high school offices. Our high school nurses are trained, and we have a standing order to administer it there only. Only at the high school. The, the, the additional stuff that is permissible, but that we haven't gone down that path yet, would be to extend the administration of naloxone to non-medical professionals with training by DOH. But after extensive discussion, it seems like that was chewing off more liability than we necessarily yeah, wanted. Yeah. So. Right, but the idea of sort of a general order to be able to extend to the community members um, to make, seems to make some sense and add something we can definitely well, I was actually worried about the liability of having naloxone on site and saying, well, I can't administer it because you're not mm -hmm. a right. student or staff. So the, the conversation at the policy committee was um, let's administer and see you in court. But that would be nice, yeah. Right, and so I realized I shouldn't be... That, that was our conversation, was that we prefer to go that route. There's Good Samaritan protections under New York State law. Samaritan. Yeah, there's actually, in addition to the general Good Samaritan protection, there's also a specific Good Samaritan carve-out for naloxone, and those who administer it. Oh, is that right? There is a okay. new release right. of liability. So what I might recommend is that we pass this as a first reading, we come back and clarify that language for have this conversation in a second reading to make sure that we're in compliance yeah. with what the board wants and wishes, if that makes sense. So I move policy 8121.1 for a first reading. Second. Second by Pat. And Eldridge is back. Nicole had to step out. Um, just one question regarding um, this is during the school day. After the school day, something happens at the basketball game. That's 911, or there's typically an athletic event. There are. There's a nurse on site, which we likely would because of the AED requirements as well. Um, if there is a nurse on site, that person could administer naloxone, notwithstanding the end of the school day. So, um, but it would have to be a trained medical professional, or 911 would have to be called. Right. Yeah, well, this is the athletic trainer qualified for training. So we, pay, we pay Q Medical for the yep. athletic trainer on site. Is that person qualified? I don't know that. So the person would have to have an RN, uh, an RN or a physician's assistant or MD. I believe are the only credentials under which naloxone could be administered. So you have to have an actual medical certification, not uh, not just the AED training. But if we have someone who's AED trained and also has an, an RN after their name, that would be yeah. We just have a lot of after school events, that's all. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, Question. You know, yeah. yeah. Could be <laughs> called next week, I mean, you know, with right. 400 well, people there. Right. This, is, this is what stymied us on the original anaphylaxis. It's, it's do we write a policy that promises that every time there's an event at one of our schools, everyone 
no. will be covered and 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 what where does that lead us if we can't provide that coverage at if we can't guarantee to provide that coverage at every single event and that if if in guaranteeing that it runs into say a financial outlay and 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 do we want to have as much coverage as we can provide without us, without making things so complicated that it's right. impossible to implement. Well, and that's why I was asking about the athletic trainer, because you, you're already paying for someone to be on site. They have to have a medical medical credential, unfortunately. Yeah. Under this current version, so the, the other option that is legally permissible but that's not reflected in the policy will be to allow non-medical volunteers to administer naloxone. That's the other option. That's not what's in the policy as currently drafted, though. So... That's correct. Thanks for clarification. Uh, but we'll uh, come back to it. Move second to for first reading. All in favor? <laughs> that is, that's everyone. And as mentioned, Nicole has stepped out. Albert is back. And Sean, that's it for policy, correct? For the time being, we'll see you for the rest of the year. We look forward to that. That's great. Uh, then we have a few more items. Uh, Something about a leaf symposium. I'm not sure what kind of leaves we're talking about, but um, <laughs> I can speak to it briefly. Okay, Dr. Brown. Um, oh, oh, this is something else. Okay, the, the, the thing, the thing, yeah. uh, on Thursday and Friday this week, um, the New York State School Board, the New York State Council of School Superintendents, in a joint effort with uh, New York State School Board Association and the Administrative Association, are partnering on an event to. Quite frankly, it's to increase the diversity and leadership in New York State, um, particularly at the superintendent level, which uh, is seeing fewer and fewer people of color assuming the superintendency each year. And not only fewer and fewer people assuming the superintendency, the length of their tenures are decreasing as opposed to <laughs> um, being longer. So that is an issue. And, it's, and over the last year, um, particularly in my travels, it's become, even, it's become a glaring issue in our state. So with that being the frame, um, these great organizations have come together to do something about it. And this is a, a, not just to talk about the issue, but to actually put some structures and processes in places to change it. With that being said, this first this symposium of thought leaders is um, the first time to bring all of those folks together, folks together from across our state to begin to put together a plan. And fortunately, um, we know some folks who are going to be speaking at this event. I will open it up, but I will quickly turn it over to Sean Lee Bradwell, who, been, who has been invited to be uh, the keynote speaker for the event. And the morning will be around, it will be about Sean, Sean sharing up, I hope it's a diversity kills talk, but he's going to be talking about um, the need for increasing the diversity and leadership in our state. But then uh, the afternoon will be focused on action steps, mixed groups, small groups, small group conversations, and we hope that some strategies are going to come out that can impact this issue. Uh, so I think on the agenda tonight, we have some board members and most boards across our state are sending a representative. If not sending someone, they are going to be watching it um, and hoping to send someone the next um, opportunity. So I think we're sending someone also. So that was something about what was going to happen. Sean, Sean, Sean speaking and Elder, it's going. Right. Okay. I'll, I'll gotcha. move to approve the expenditure for the on the bodyguard. Second. Second by Pat. Um, Elder's going to go and ask questions. It's, it should be interesting. I'd, uh, I'd like to, uh, I'd like to be there, man. I've, I've already been strategizing, but trust me, I already got an idea. All right, uh, I would uh, like to see that. But uh, um, but I'm not going. But that's what uh, I have things to do. But anyway, let's. Um, any, any questions? Anything? Are we good? Uh, move seconded. All in favor? That's everyone. Thank you. Yeah, it should be very interesting, and that's uh, that's coming up shortly. Um, and then we have a capital conference authorization as well. Um, and the capital conference is what? That's the I can't call it a lobbying day. It's an information day. Yeah. Uh, meet your legislator day. Yeah, meet, meet, meet your legislator. Day. Uh, okay. And we've been. Uh, we've this board's been reasonably represented over the years uh, going to this and meeting with our representatives, although we may be meeting with, attempting to meet with some different representatives this time because we have a whole rule of law proposed having to do with the reserve for the health insurance. And so we may also be meeting with some uh, 
senators not are wrong. And Brad, actually, when you mention a home rule law, this is actually uh, something that needs to be approved just for us. Yes. Just for the ICT yeah. City School District so by with, Albany, right? With the self insurance, uh, the law to allow us to have a reserve to go with the self insurance fund. All right. So it is important that uh, we send send you all, meaning Ann, Eldred, and Brad, to speak for us. And, uh, I have a question on this, um, Jennifer. I, when we were talking about it at the committee meeting, I was trying to remember, we decided that we were going to approve it, but we might only go for one day, right? Is right. That, so, yeah. so we may not end up... Right, you might taking the full. Maybe um, just be there and back again. Yeah. You still have to authorize the expenditure. Right, so yeah. just so you know, though, it in may, the past, may not end up being an expenditure. In the past, yeah. we've just driven up early on Monday morning, yeah. done that, come on back Monday afternoon. I think as a board, we're very much aware of the value of having this kind of representation to speak in this way. So I uh, move the motion to approve expenditures for the attendance of the NISBA 2018 Capital Conference for the three board members listed. Second. Second by Pat. And uh, February, uh, really hard to say what the weather will be. Yeah, last year it so snowed out. Bad. It was actually, it was actually canceled. Last it was canceled. Right. Yeah. So, um, so go to two, two days if needed. So uh, move seconded. All in favor? That's everyone. And any other business for the good of the group? Are we good, Dr. Brown? Anything else? We don't have anything. Okay. Uh, when we'll be moving our policy committee meeting, folks can see it's reflected. I believe it's reflected here in the minutes. It is. It's reflected in the minutes that we had a, a slight change in policy for next month, January. So we'll be meeting on December the 19th, I want to say. I'm probably way off. Right before the board yep. meeting. Yeah, there you go. Yep. Right. At 445. I actually saw that without my glasses. Pretty impressive. Um, other, other meeting dates are listed, and uh, look for those. Uh, updates from Jennifer, as we always get, which we appreciate. Um, our meeting dates in December are slightly different because of the holiday breaks and season. So um, we are going to meet uh, our next our next voting meeting is when Jennifer the nineteenth the nineteenth. There we go. Uh, the week before Christmas, right? Sounds good. Um, it's hard to believe it's December already. No, it's not. <laughs> Chris made it through Thanksgiving. That's right. That's right. <laughs> just, uh, <laughs> just have to get through uh, everything else. Yeah, yeah. Anything else? Are we good? Uh, without, without objection, we are adjourned. Thanks, everybody. Yeah.